Salam alaikum, namaste, domo arigato, and baba bui, my habibi. I know what you desire, dear viewer. The secrets of the universe, and I, the intergalactic cosmic big brain man, will give them to you. But first, I must deliver a warning. Planet Earth is about to be recycled. Your only chance to evacuate is to leave with us. So come with me to Heaven's Gate. But before we get into the mad lad, this video is sponsored by Raycon. Raycon wireless earbuds start at half the price of other premium earbuds on the market without sacrificing any sound quality and are endorsed by celebrities like Snoop Dogg, Rich the Kid and Mike Tyson. Raycons are discreet and even though most earbuds don't fit me, they fit in my stupid ears and I use my Raycons to listen to music and podcasts while I'm working out or when I'm out fishing. And Raycons everyday E25 buds are their best ones yet, with 6 hours of playtime, seamless Bluetooth pairing, more bass and a compact design that gives you a nice noise isolating fit, and it comes in several fun colours. So click my link down below, buyraycon.com slash dankula to get 15% off your order. To understand what Heaven's Gate is, we first have to look at the history of the man who started it. A rather interesting man named Marshall Applewhite, who was born in 1931. His father was a former soldier and Presbyterian minister who introduced Marshall to biblical prophecy at an early age, but Marshall didn't really start pursuing biblical prophecy, you know, like, really pursuing it, until the 1970s. In 1972, Marshall was fired from St. Thomas University in Houston, Texas, where he worked as a music professor, after he was accused of having an affair with one of his male students. This accusation also resulted in his wife of 16 years leaving him. Shortly after this, he met a woman named Bonnie Nettles, who was a nurse that was also going through a divorce. They both related to each other's situations, and they both shared a keen interest in biblical prophecy. It's said that Marshall and Bonnie met at a hospital that Bonnie was working at, while Marshall was in the hospital visiting a sick friend. But further evidence suggests that the hospital they met in wasn't a normal hospital. It was an asylum. And Bonnie worked in there as a nurse. And Marshall wasn't in there to visit a sick friend. Marshall was a patient. Marshall told Bonnie that they had in fact met in a past life. And Bonnie told Marshall that their meeting was actually prophesied by aliens. So they hit it off right away. Because they were both just as mental as each other. They studied a lot of biblical scripture together, as well as books written by psychiatrists and occultists. But their favourite thing to read together was sci-fi novels about aliens. After a lot of studying and a lot of soul searching together, Marshall and Bonnie reached the very reasonable conclusion that both of them were divine beings that had been divinely blessed with extremely advanced big smart brains, much smarter than human brains, and that they had been chosen by a higher power to fulfil Biblical prophecies. 
Marshall and Bonnie also established that both of them were the two witnesses, as described in the Book of Revelation. And so they felt they needed to let everybody know just who they were. And they started this by creating pamphlets and handing them out to people. And these pamphlets stated that Jesus Christ had been reincarnated as a Texan. Of course, they were talking about Marshall, who was Texan. Marshall and Bonnie both believed that Marshall was the reincarnation of Jesus Christ. They then decided to go on a spiritual pilgrimage around America and attend meetings of spiritual groups and churches by just walking in and telling everyone that they were the two witnesses from the book of Revelation and that they would be killed but resurrected and transported onto a spaceship to be taken to another planet, a planet called the Next Level. You will be shocked to hear that everyone just thought they were mental and kicked them out. This journey that they were on left them in a bad financial situation and it was during this time that Marshall Applewhite was arrested for stealing a rental car where he was then sentenced to six months in prison. After he was released, Marshall and Bonnie decided to change their approach towards their mission, if you want to call it that. They knew they were going to need to step up their game if they were to find like-minded individuals like themselves. So they started placing ads in newspapers and asking for people to help them contact aliens. And people responded. Quite a lot of people responded. So Marshall and Bonnie held multiple meetings to address their new followers, who they nicknamed the crew. You know, like the crew of a spaceship. At the meetings, Marshall and Bonnie would tell the crew that they were the two witnesses as described in the book of Revelation, and that they were also representatives of beings from another planet. And this planet was called the Next Level, and that these particular beings that Marshall and Bonnie were representing were looking for humans to take part in an experiment, and that those lucky humans who took part in the experiment would be raised to a higher evolutionary level like Marshall and Bonnie had. This cult has barely started and everything is already mental. They decided to name their group Human Individual Metamorphosis, or HIM. As the group grew, Marshall Applewhite made contact with famed UFO researcher Hayden Hughes, at which point Applewhite told Hughes that he had telepathic powers and he told Hughes that if he ever needed to get a hold of him, all Hughes had to do was pray using a secret code and Marshall would be able to hear him. He said, uh, Mr. Hughes, if you ever need to get a hold of me, uh, gave me a secret code, which was mentally praying to Bonnie and Herf with the Lord's Prayer. You know... A secret code. Your telepathic phone number. After a particular event that we are about to get into, Hughes decided to use the secret code and pray to contact Marshall Applewhite. There was widespread publicity about some people that disappeared in Oregon after attending a UFO lecture. So I decided to use the code. Then the next morning received a telephone call, and when he said, you have now asked, I thought, well, maybe these people are, you know, who they say they are. The event that he's referring to happened in 1975, which is when the cult would first make it into the mainstream media. 
Marshall Applewhite and the cult arranged a cult meeting at a hotel in Waldport, Oregon. The purpose of this meeting was for all cult members to begin their journey. So in preparation, all of the cult members sold all of their worldly possessions, said goodbye to their loved ones, and they all met at the hotel. And then, they vanished. There was no trace of them. The hotel actually contacted the police because about a hundred of their guests had just disappeared. The disappearance was even reported on the mainstream news by Walter Cronkite. People seemed very concerned and media outlets were coming up with theories like had the group actually embarked on their trip to eternity or had they all just been kidnapped? It turned out that it was neither. This was just a stunt for the group to go completely underground, where they travelled across the country, sleeping rough in the streets and begging for food, which seems quite embarrassing for beings of a higher evolutionary level, like Marshall and Bonnie, but they said that the purpose of this was to help their followers achieve the higher evolutionary level, like they had. So we isolated ourselves in this small group of 60 or 70 people and we didn't have contact with our families. We were isolated. Marshall and Bonnie had been using the nicknames Bo and Peep, but around this time they changed their nicknames to Do and T, like Do, Re, Mi, Fa, Sol, La, T. Sort of like we are the Alpha to the Omega, except in this case it was we are the door to the T. During this journey of being homeless, Marshall and Bonnie further indoctrinated their students free from the eyes of the media or authorities checking up on them. This gave them a lot more freedom when it came to brainwashing people. During their homeless journey across the United States, they ran several recruitment drives to recruit even more members. Marshall would greet these prospective new members by telling them that he was directly related to Jesus and that he was Christ's present representative on earth. Because you see, Marshall's bodily vessel was inhabited by the same alien spirit that belonged to to Jesus Christ, and that Marshall was an evolutionary kingdom level above human. And somehow, these recruitment methods worked, and a lot more people started joining. Now, if a homeless man walks up to you in the street telling you he is related to Jesus, he has a super alien brain, his body is possessed by Jesus' alien spirit, and he wants you to join his religion, what you are supposed to do is you put a wee pound coin in his hand and you walk away. You don't actually join his religion. This journey continued throughout the 70s and 80s and more and more members kept joining. Prospective members would be invited to meditate in the sun with the UFO2, as people had come to call them, where they would then be told that everything they believed was wrong, because they had been deceived by false god, human spirits. As for the type of people who joined the cult, that varied. Most of them were sort of hippy-dippy spiritual types, or people who were trying to find themselves. But some members were actually quite unique. At one point, John Craig, a Republican who was running for the Colorado House of Representatives, actually became a member for a while. The membership grew and grew, with a lot of people joining the cult, until eventually the cult became a lot more reclusive, and they had chosen the cult's final name. Heaven's Gate. It was around this point that the cult decided to end its homeless spiritual recruitment journey across America, and finally settle down. The cult rented a very large house in Rancho Santa Fe, California that they paid $7,000 a month for 
and they always paid in cash. The cult members decided to name this house the Monastery and it would now be the focal point and home base for all of their lessons and teachings. Now I know what you're thinking. How the hell could the cult afford such high rent? Well, it's because they had a business that they made money from, and this business was named Higher Source. And it was a web development company. All of the cult members were web developers, and they made websites for other companies. A lot of old school websites back in the day were made by Heaven's Gate. They made so much money from this that they were able to take out full page ads in major newspapers advertising the cult to recruit new members. They also used their money to take out alien abduction insurance which would have paid out one million dollars per member for any instances of abduction, impregnation or death caused by aliens. But before we get into what went on at the monastery, let's have a good deep look into the belief system of the cult. What were the cult's beliefs? Well, strap yourselves in. Like any decent cult worth their salt, their primary belief was their doomsday prophecy. You just aren't a cult if you don't have a doomsday prophecy. And Marshall and Bonnie told their followers that by the year 2027, Earth was going to be recycled, renewed, wiped clean by an alien race. You know, just like in Prometheus or Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And the only way that the cult followers would survive this recycling would be if they could ascend their consciousness to a higher evolutionary level so that when the time came they would be able to board the alien spaceship that was coming to earth to pick them up and and take them to the next level but they could only board this spaceship if they had achieved Tela, which stood for the evolutionary level above human at least that was the first iteration of this story because this prophecy was ruined when in 1985 Bonnie Nettles passed away from brain cancer. Now, how could this be? She was one of the chosen two. She was one of the big alien brains sent to Earth to guide everyone to the next level. Her dying completely destroys the whole prophecy. But not to worry, Marshall Applewhite simply changed the prophecy. He changed the prophecy to say that you didn't actually need to have a physical body to ascend to the next level. And that when you died, if you had elevated your consciousness and achieved Teller, your consciousness itself would be uploaded to the alien mothership. No need for a physical body. After Marshall changed the prophecy, the cult members started referring to their bodies as vehicles or vessels. They now viewed their bodies simply as meat sacks that they used to carry their consciousness around. One thing that I think is very important to mention is that when Bonnie was dying from cancer, Marshall Applewhite did not notify her family or her children. Her children didn't even learn she died until much later. And because of this, Bonnie Nettles died all alone in the hospital. Because her family had no idea. She was only a few hours away from me. So nobody even bothered to call me to... Um tell me that my mom was dying so that I could be there with her. Nothing. My entire insides felt like it had been ripped out. But to get back into the cult's beliefs, how does one elevate their consciousness to this higher 
evolutionary level. How do you achieve Teller? Well, firstly, you had to shed every human attachment you had on planet Earth. This meant giving up all worldly possessions as well as all of your friends and family. You also had to give up all of your human characteristics and desires. This included things like your individuality, your job, your desire for money. You even had to give up your name. All of the cult members changed their names to words that ended in Ode, like Avnode, Olode, Jimode. Weird, weird, right? Really, really weird names. But the most important thing that you had to give up was the basis of the human urges. Sexual desire. Marshall Applewhite, for his entire life, struggled with his sexuality. He was gay. Marshall Applewhite was gay. But he really wished he wasn't gay. Well, sorry Marshall, but that's not quite how it works. But Marshall really, really resented his sexuality. He hated having gay desires. He hated having gay urges. And it seems that Marshall took this a step further by believing that all sexual desire was wrong. So Marshall Applewhite decided to lead the charge for the rest of the cult in ridding himself of his sexual desires. By travelling to Mexico for an appointment with a back alley surgeon and having himself castrated. This resulted in many other male members of the cult going to Mexico and having the same procedure. The reason they all went to Mexico like Applewhite is because one member of the cult was a nurse and she said, oh, I could probably do the castrations here. There's no need for us to take expensive trips to Mexico. But the first cult member she tried it on, she absolutely botched the operation and almost killed him. After this, all of the cult members instead just went to Mexico. But on to the next level. What was the next level? Well, it was the cult version of heaven, but instead of seeing it as a, another dimension or another plane or something like that, like we do, Heaven's Gate saw the next level as an actual physical planet, but it was a planet that they considered to be their heaven. A planet where they would ascend to and become super beings, beings that had no need for base human desires like sex or hunger, and they would nourish themselves solely on pure sunlight. So a plant. You'll become a plant. Imagine cutting your balls off and your reward is you get reincarnated as a bush. The cult also believed that all religions on earth were linked and that they all worshipped the same god, who was actually a highly intelligent very powerful alien. The cult, however, warned of false prophets who they called Luciferians, who would falsely represent themselves on earth as gods. These Luciferians were apparently very advanced humanoids that used hologram technology to fake miracles, and they also had the powers of time travel, telepathy, and eternal life. They also apparently had spaceships that they kept hidden around the earth and you were not to believe these Luciferians, no, 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 for they were false prophets and that all existing religions on earth had been corrupted by the Luciferians to prevent people from worshipping the one true God, a big alien. The cult members also believed in possession, but not by spirits, no, no, that, that's just silly. They believed in possession by aliens. 
You see, they believe that human bodies, you know, vessels or vehicles, that were empty of a consciousness could be possessed by aliens. But they never called these possessions. They called them walk-ins. You know, like a barber shop. They believed that a higher alien consciousness could just walk in to your body. And this is what Marshall and Bonnie told their followers that they were. They told their followers that they were no longer Marshall and Bonnie. They were, in fact, aliens that had simply possessed or walked into Marshall and Bonnie's bodies. Marshall took this even further by telling the cult members that the alien presence that had walked into his body was the same alien presence that had walked into Jesus Christ's body 2,000 years ago. But the biggest belief that the cult propagated is one that still exists to this day and has actually become extremely popular. We are not alone in the universe. We're getting closer to the truth. Antarctica may hold lost remnants of an extraterrestrial civilization with groundbreaking new theories. All of the cultures were trying to signal some kind of sky people. Yes, the whole premise of ancient aliens was a core belief of the cult, a major belief. The cult were the ones that actually popularized this. The cult believed the aliens had come to Earth in the past and seeded it with human life. And now the aliens were returning to harvest their crop by selecting individuals from among the human population of Earth who had achieved the evolutionary next level, or Teller, so that the aliens could ascend these humans into a transhuman state. And those humans that were not selected by the aliens would be left behind to wallow in the spiritually poisoned atmosphere of a corrupt world. And the only thing that could save you from this damnation was to follow the teachings of Marshall Applewhite. So those were the cult's beliefs. Now we can get back to the monastery. The cult lived in this house together as a commune, sharing in the chores, sharing in the tasks, and discussing their teachings and philosophies with each other, and for the most part, they were pretty harmless. Apart from all the castrations. The cult had also started producing videos that they shared on their own website, and one of these videos was the infamous induction tape featuring Marshall Applewhite. And this induction video is the one that they would make all new cult members watch. We're going to talk to you about the most urgent thing that is on our mind and what we suspect is the most urgent thing on the minds of those who will connect with us. We'll title this tape, uh, Planet Earth About to be recycled. Your only chance to evacuate is to leave with us. How that video didn't just make everyone instantly get up and leave the room, I will never know. But while the cult were living in the house, a cosmic event happened. An event that would set the wheels in motion for something terrible. It's called the Hail Bop Comet, named after the two men who discovered it. It's nothing to do with the music scene, and it's becoming brighter as it approaches the sun. Around the world, astronomers have been searching the night sky. OK, we got the comet. A ball of ice, the Hail Bop Comet is 25 miles across and weighs millions of tons. It throws off a trail of water vapour and gases. And the closer it gets to the sun, the brighter it gets. The hail bop Comet was discovered in 1995, and it was making a pass over Earth. And soon, it would be very visible to the naked eye. Scientists started publishing the discovery of this new comet, and even managed to figure out that it appears over the Earth roughly every 2,000 years. 
Marshall Applewhite heard about the comet and connected it to something else that happened about 2,000 years ago. And he believed it was a sign. Marshall Applewhite told his followers that the alien mothership that was to take them all away to the next level was hiding in the tail of the comet and that when the comet passed over the earth and they could see it, that meant that it was time for them to upload their consciousness to the mothership and be taken away to the next level. But in order for them to do that, all of the members would need to leave their vehicles. You all know where this is going. And the way for them to do this would be to commit suicide. The cult members were all going to commit mass suicide so that their consciences that had achieved Teller would leave their vehicles and be beamed up to the mothership that would then take their consciences to the next level. The cult, however, did not consider this to be suicide. What the cult considered suicide was to turn away from the next level, to refuse to go on the alien mothership. So you see, to the cult, the real way to commit suicide was to not commit suicide. So, in preparation, the cult members all recorded their final goodbye messages, talking about how excited they were to go to the next level and how all of their hard work had finally paid off and they would finally be taken aboard the alien mothership and taken to the next level, where their enlightened minds would live on for eternity. Marshall Applewhite took this opportunity to record his own final message. I'm Doe, uh, some called our partnership T and Doe. That's not my name, but that's how I'm referred to on planet Earth at this time. I've been talking to my students that are sitting in front of me about <clears throat> talking to you and let me say that our mission here at this time is about to come to a close in the next few days. <clears throat> we came from distant space and even what some might call somewhat of another dimension. And we're about to return from whence we came. Applewhite told his followers that after the comet had passed, Heaven's Gate would be closed, so the cult had to exit their vehicles in the next few days or they would miss their chance. So Applewhite and the other 38 members living in the monastery prepared themselves for the mass suicide. The cult made copies of these tapes and sent them to ex-members of the cult as well as any other associated people, one of whom was a man called Rio D'Angelo, who, upon seeing these tapes, was so horrified that he actually drove to the monastery to check on the cult. Rio knocked on the front door of the house, but there was no response. So he went to the back door of the house and found that it was unlocked. He went inside and realised that he was too late. He found the bodies of all 39 cult members. He contacted the police and the police all came to the property and began their investigation. The police discovered that the cult members had committed suicide by taking phenobarbital, mixing it with applesauce and chocolate pudding and then eating it. Then the cult members downed a bunch of vodka and placed plastic bags over their heads so that the poison plus the asphyxiation would kill them. Now mass suicide by ingesting poison is pretty standard fare for a doomsday cult, but what really made Heaven's Gate 
stand out from all of the others was the seemingly ritualistic and symbolic way that they went about it. For example, when it was time to commit suicide, all of the cult members dressed in matching tracksuits with arm patches that said, Heaven's Gate Away Team. Each member of the cult was also wearing a pair of Nike Decades. At the time of the suicide, all members of the cult were dressed exactly the same. The suicides commenced on the 22nd of March 1997 and the cult committed suicide over the next three days in three groups. On the first day, 15 people. On the second day, another 15 people. And on the final day, the final nine people, which included Applewhite. Whoever was still alive after the last group killed themselves, their job was to tidy up any mess and then remove the plastic bags from the bodies' heads and then place the bodies in the correct position, which was to place the bodies on their beds with their arms folded over themselves and then a ceremonial purple cloth was draped over the body. Each body also had a $5 bill and a roll of quarters in their pocket. So what was the symbolism behind all of this? Well, the matching tracksuits were to represent unity. The cloths placed over the heads and faces were for privacy and to preserve the dignity of the person. As for the $5 bill and roll of quarters in each of their pockets, a lot of people have said that this was the payment to board the mothership. You know, like bus fare. But the money in their pockets was actually based on an old rule the cult had back when they were doing their homeless pilgrimage across America. The $5 bill was to pay vagrancy fines and the roll of quarters was so they could use payphones. They didn't need this anymore since they now had a house and weren't homeless and didn't need to worry about any of that, but for some reason the cult members still followed this old rule. But the most symbolic thing about the suicides, and the main thing that everyone remembers about the event, were the 1993 Nike decades on everyone's feet. They probably stand out the most because all of the cult members were wearing Nike Decades and the Nike Decades were the only thing you could really see poking out from under the cloth. This, for some reason, resulted in a huge increase of sales of Nike Decades and the original 1993 Nike Decades that the cult wore are now highly sought after collector's items. So what was the meaning behind the night decades. There was no meaning. The cult just got a good deal on a bulk order of shoes. That was it. That was the only reason they were all wearing night decades. It was just because the guy at the shoe shop gave them a good price on a bulk order. Nike, to this day, have refused to comment on Heaven's Gate wearing their shoes. But right after the suicides, Nike discontinued their 1993 version of Nike Decades. But Nike still make modern versions of Nike Decades to this day. And they are a pretty good shoe. What? The police had to bring out several trucks to take away all of the bodies. It was later theorised that Applewhite was the third last person to die, as there were two bodies found not in the ceremonial position that had not had the plastic bags removed from their heads. So it's believed that these last two members were the ones who helped Applewhite commit suicide. The news of this obviously shocked the nation, and shocked very many of the cult's members outside of the monastery, and other members of the cult were very, very sad. But not for the reasons you would expect. I wished that I was with them. It's not really a regret in the sense that, uh, gee, I lost my chance at a million dollar lotto because I lost the, the ticket or I didn't play today. It's more of a, 
of uh, kicking myself for not having done enough of my own homework. Another three members of the cult who didn't live at the monastery also committed suicide themselves, hoping to join Applewhite and the others aboard the spaceship. The mass suicide wiped out the whole cult, either through the suicide itself or people leaving the cult because they were horrified by the events. But two people, Mark and Sarah King, to this day, remain part of the cult. And since everyone else has quit the cult or died in the suicide, Mark and Sarah are pretty much the cult's only two surviving members. Now, why did they not go with Applewhite to the next level? Why were they left behind? It's because they were chosen by Applewhite to stay behind to run the Heaven's Gate website. I'm not joking. They were spared from the mass suicide because Applewhite wanted someone to stay behind on Earth to run the Heaven's Gate website. And the website's still up. It is still up. It hasn't been updated in a very long time, but someone has been paying the hosting fees for the last 23 years. And, and while I was actually writing this video, I seen an email address on the website and I thought, I'll, I'll drop it a little email, see if there's anyone actually on the website behind the scenes. And I got a reply from Sarah and I asked her, why, why, why didn't you go with Applewhite and the others? And she just told me it's because we were chosen to stay behind to manage the website. But she doesn't feel too bad about it though. Because Heaven's Gate believe in reincarnation. So Sarah and Mark, they, they know that they're just going to get reincarnated over and over again. And every time they get reincarnated in their new life, they will still manage the website. And they're going to keep doing that for the next 2,000 years when the hail bop comet comes back. <laughs> and then in 2,000 years after a bunch of reincarnations and, you know, paying the hosting fees for the site, do that for 2,000 years. Hail Bop Comet comes back, they will then yeet themselves and they will be able to join Applewhite and the others on the next level. These are real people. Now obviously what happened to Heaven's Gate was a tragedy and it's a good example of what can happen when people are led astray by someone who was clearly very mentally ill. Sometimes people believe crazy things, but you can have some kind of understanding of why they believe in them and you can in some sense take pity. But in the case of Heaven's Gate, you had an ex-mental patient telling you that he was one of the witnesses from the Book of Revelation, that he was possessed by the alien spirit of Jesus Christ, that aliens were coming to destroy the planet and the only way you could be saved was to board the alien mothership with him and to do so, you had to cut your balls off. I mean... Come on! See, this is why I'm not worried about Extinction Rebellion. Because if history's taught us anything, it's that cults with doomsday prophecies are problems that end up taking care of themselves. It's Count Dankula on YouTube! Everybody subscribe!